Welcome to this session, which uh, is sponsored by uh, Tech London Advocates Createch and is part of London Tech Week. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the session today. So my name is Julie Barber. I am CEO of Spark Consulting, where we work with startups and scale ups to help them build effective strategies to fundraise successfully and to implement corporate governance as they scale and grow. Uh, I'm also a non-exec director for three companies and uh, a mentor for startup and scale up accelerators as well. Uh, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Julie A. Barber afterwards um, if you would like to ask any more questions. And throughout the session today, I want to encourage you to pop questions into the chat to feel free to ask away as we go and I will do my level best to answer as many questions as I can. So what are we here to talk about? We're looking at what do investors really want? And of course, infuriatingly, the answer is it depends. Uh, whether um, you're fundraising at pre-seed, seed, series A. Um, and let's be, let's be clear that um, pre-seed means pre-product and pre-revenue, so it's at idea stage. Seed usually means you've got a product and um, you've maybe got some initial traction but not full product market fit. Um, uh, and I'll apologise now for random squeaking in the background. My dog's playing with... Uh, a toy um, uh, and series A is generally when you've started to really establish some solid product market fit and you've got good revenue, good customer traction and you are really starting to move. Um, uh, okay, we've just got a couple of people saying, um, Uh, a couple of people having some access issues, uh, but hopefully they will be sorted out. OK, so um, so not just uh, the stage of investment that you're at can have a huge impact, but of course, the sector. So revenue expectations can be wildly different from investors. Um, and also the concerns that investors have will vary massively at the top level, though. Um, investors want a credible team, they want great products or services, they want huge market mm -hmm. opportunities that offer big returns, and also they want a clear indication that you have the execution capability to make it all happen. Uh, we've got a question from Fabiola that says, um, uh, what VCs want pre-seed stage again, please? So pre-seed stage is when you've got no product or no um, service, no traction revenue yet, um, and you're at an idea stage. So um, some VCs do invest at that stage, but we'll talk about that later when we get to talking about um, uh, the investor specifications. Okay, so your pitch materials and your pitch, your verbal pitch itself, are your way of communicating all the things that investors want in a way that gives them confidence and not concerns. It's your job as a founder to really do your research and to figure out what investors in your space are looking for and what they're worried by, and then make sure that you address every single point Every investor who reviews a pitch deck or listens to a pitch has two checklists in their head, positive things that they're looking for and red flags that they're hoping to avoid. And you need to make sure that you get ticks all down the positives list and that you don't trigger any of the red flags on the other list. So, um, <clears throat> And of course, investors have some basic expectations. So they don't want decks that are as long as war and peace. They, they're looking for 10 to 15 slides in a deck. Um, there is standard content that they would expect to see within a pitch deck, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, and also they want you to establish credibility through your documents. 
And that doesn't just mean your personal credibility, but also the credibility of your data, your assumptions, all of those things. Um, because if they feel like they're just made up, then you're definitely not going to get any money. So today, during this session, during the next sort of 50, 55 minutes, um, the uh, what I'm going to do is going to take you through six key steps that apply to every pitch, whether you're in Createc or, or whether you're in um, uh, different areas, actually. But for each step, we'll talk about how investor expectations might vary depending upon whether your business is at pre-seed, seed or Series A stage. And we'll also talk about some differences in different sectors as well. So. The aim of the session is to give you lots of helpful information, lots of things to think about. Um, and as I said, keep asking questions as we go and I will do my best to answer them for you. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is vision, your vision for the company. Now, some people think that vision can be a bit of a fluffy term, talking about all oh, the company vision and how easy is it to have a defined vision, particularly if you're at pre-seed when you don't even have a product yet? Um, but investors care about the vision for your company for a number of reasons, and they're really important ones. Um, they use your vision to help them decide if it's a journey that they want to be part of, if it's a direction that they would be happy going in um, and that they feel that their money would be well used in that journey. Um, your vision also helps them judge your credibility as a founder. If they think your vision is far-fetched, unachievable, not realistic for, for some reason, that can obviously damage your chances of raising investment. The investors are also going to use your vision to check your maths. So if you say, in our vision, we expect to expand into France, Germany um, and Poland next year, but your, um, your financial model or the amount of money that you're raising is clearly insufficient to achieve that, then that's going to light up one of those red flag buttons over on this list over here where they say, actually, the vision and the maths don't really um, match up. So being super clear about your vision and what the strategic milestones are within it, and then making sure that the rest of your pitch materials actually reconcile to that is super important from an investor's perspective. Um, uh, lastly, investors care about vision because um, uh, they want to know particularly how they're going to get their money back and how they're going to get not just their money back, but a decent return on that money as well. So they want to know that, you know, you are thinking about exit plans, even as early as pre-seed. It doesn't mean at pre-seed level that you have to be saying, oh, we're going to um, have a trade sale to this company uh, in March 2025, because that would be ridiculous. Um, but it does mean that you need to show that you understand M&A activity in your sector, um, uh, that you understand where the likely opportunities might be to sell your company, whether it's a trade sale, whether it's an IPO. If you have dreams of doing an IPO, why that would be the right answer for this type of company, um, you need to start being able to explain that even at the earliest stages if nothing else, to give investors the confidence that they might actually get their money back at some point and that you're not just expecting them to donate to the cause and they never get anything back after that point. So what goes into your vision becomes obviously very important. So um, this is where you have to be super careful because uh, obviously, you know, if someone says to you, what would your company look like in five years and you're just starting out, um, that can be a very difficult question to answer. But a good vision is made up of several components. So it's made up of really understanding in depth what the problem is, understanding why you want to solve it, why you're the right person to solve it, why now is the right time to solve it as well, and then what the solution is and how far <clears throat> you want to take 
that solution and this business when solving that problem. So Microsoft started out with um, uh, a, a very short but a very definable vision. We want to put um, a computer in every household. So actually, that's a very definable metric. It's something that they set out. They didn't set out to achieve that within five years, but it was their lifetime vision for the company. Um, Typically, when you're talking to startup investors, you need at least a five year vision. If you've got a longer moonshot vision as well, great. Um, but you need to be able to describe those elements of the vision and to be able to break that down into some real strategic milestones and metrics which help to anchor the journey that you're describing to them. Uh, so. Um, so let me give you uh, an example. Um, someone we've been uh, working with recently is uh, Joe Eckersley at Bubble. Uh, and they have an, uh, an ad tech product which allows brands to deliver content direct to people's phones based on their geolocation. So you walk into um, a brand's store and it immediately pops up with here are the latest offers from this shop. Um, here are the latest, uh, you know, experiences that you can have. So Joe is very clear that the future of retail and gaming is all about experience. And she knows that the tech is just becoming available to make all of this possible. So she's arrived at the right time with the ability to solve a problem when the technologies become available to be able to solve the problem. And she has a very clear vision that this will be able to take the company forward over several years, um, working with more and more brands across retail, gaming and other sectors that will allow them to uh, to create you know, functionality that changes people's experience of those things for good and for the better. So really thinking about what that vision will be um, uh, so, so if you're at pre-seed, your vision, you know, can be a little bit less um, defined, but some good metrics are still helpful. Once you're at seed and you've got some traction and you've got some, uh, you know, you've got your product, you should have a bit more of a clearly defined um, vision with some with some stronger metrics over the, the upcoming years that show what you're hoping to hit. And by the time you're coming up to raise at Series A, you really need to, you know, be showing that based on the historical data, what you've established over the last two, three, maybe four years before you've run the Series A um, is telling you how the business is, is capable of operating in the coming uh, few years as well. And therefore, you know what that vision looks like for the journey to exit from this point. So that's vision, that's step one. Then uh, we are going to move on to step two, which is digging much more into the foundations of the business. So structure and scalability are super important to investors. Uh, both of these things are, um, are the foundations upon which you can build massive growth. But if you don't have the right structures in place for the business. And if you don't have the ability to scale the back end of the business so it can cope with front end growth, then you've got a real problem and, and you have a business that will trip over itself that will repeatedly suffer significant issues. So showing investors that you really understand both of these areas in depth is going to be really important to getting their confidence that you can execute on um, a journey of significant growth. So when we talk about structure, what I'm talking about is um, making sure that, you know, you've got the right, um, the right uh, uh, corporate setup in the first place. Um, there have been cases where we've, where we've seen pre-seed startups going out for investment and getting investors interested only to find that they've not even incorporated the company yet and therefore there's no vehicle to invest in. So even the basics like making sure you're actually incorporated before, before you go out to seek at least equity investment 
um, is really important. Some grants you can get before you need to incorporate, but for things like equity investment, you can't sell a share of something that doesn't exist. Uh, also part of structure is people. So your team is a massive part of what investors really want to know about. They want to know that you have the right people and they want to know um, that you know where your gaps are currently and how you will fill those gaps as time goes on. And that's um, a huge piece that can be ignored sometimes in people's pitches, because if you don't know where your gaps are and you don't know who you need to hire and when, then it becomes quite difficult to work out what your forward costs are likely to be. So then you, the amount that you're fundraising for might be right, it might be wrong. If you haven't factored in the fact um, the, the the need to hire maybe five salespeople to generate the level of sales that you're saying you want to you want to get, then you're missing a huge amount of costs, which could actually push you from from profit into into the red. So investors really want to see that you've been able to analyze the business and to understand what the team requirements are to help you move forward in, in the way that you want to. The other important thing to think about as well is that investors want to invest in a business and not just an idea. So particularly if you're a pre-seed, it's all too easy for it to sound like an idea that you had while you were having a bit of a scribble on some paper. And wouldn't it be cool if this happened? Uh, but you need to show them that that's actually possible. Uh, it's actually possible for that to be a business. And for that, you need to show them that you've thought about the people that you need, the product that you've got, the processes, um, the business assets that you'd need um to to be able to deliver on all of this the technology that you'd need all of those things have to be part of your thought process to help you move forward uh, and show them that it really is a business and not just an idea um, uh, and as you uh again as you move through to seed or to series a then you have to be showing that not only do you know what's coming next, but you've learned from the experience of what came before to show you um, how quickly you can bring on how many people, um, which kinds of people work best for your business, all of those things. So you're, you're really looking at, um, uh, at showing that you're capable of building out the structure of the business, all the elements that it takes to create it as you go. And then when you're looking at scalability, so scalability, just to repeat again, scalability is not front end growth. Scalability is how you cope with the front end growth and sales that's created. So is your product scalable? Is are your back end processes scalable to cope with growth? So if, if 10,000 people decided that they liked your product tomorrow, could you deliver to those 10,000 people or not? Um, and understanding what it would take to move you up each level in terms of taking on more customers, again, is critical. There are huge costs, there are huge risks, there are massive dependencies associated with scalability. And if you don't know what those are, then you're not going to factor them into your planning and it means you'll probably get tripped up by them, which might mean that you end up, um, you know, with risks turning into real issues, uh, with running out of money, with having to go back to investors for, for more information, uh, for more money <laughs> uh, as well, which, you know, if you're going back to investors because things have gone way better than you expected, and um, you need a bit more money to carry you through to until the next round, that's okay. If you're going back to investors because you didn't think of three or four major things and now they've come up and you've got to pay for them, that's a bit different. Uh, so, so really thinking about um, those structures and that scalability and how you articulate that to investors is vital. Okay, quick. A uh, bit of water and then we're going to move on to talk about market
So investors care about market and they care about market for three big reasons. Firstly, they want to know about product market fit, i.e. does the market want what you're selling? Uh, they also care about what your go to market strategy is, because with, is that an effective strategy? It, can you afford that strategy as well? Uh, and they also want to know how you would defend your product or service in the market too. So, um, so let's pick up um, on product market fit first. This can feel like a really hard one to establish, depending upon what stage you're at. By the time you're at Series A, you should be able to demonstrate a degree of product market fit. You've tested various versions of the product or service in the market. You've got an increasing and quite significant customer base. You've got revenue that proves that people want it. Hopefully your churn rate is relatively low, uh, which means that people are buying the product and liking it enough to keep buying the product as well. So all of those things can demonstrate product market fit by the time you get to series A and then effectively you're raising money to just help you put your foot on the gas and accelerate further and further up the curve. At the earlier stages, when you're at seed level or, or worse at pre-seed level, when you've not even got a product in the market yet, showing that you've got product market fit isn't really possible. So what you have to demonstrate instead is the precursor to product market fit, which is product, um, which is market appetite. So instead of product market fit, you're looking at market appetite. So you can't demonstrate that it fits yet, but you can demonstrate that people do want what you're selling. And there are a variety of ways that, that you can do that. Uh, so um, let's look at um, Georgina Bowman is a founder that I've worked with quite a bit. Um, she has a company called My Shoots, which helps um, the sport shooting community to connect and organize their shoots and all of that. And it's a very um, until now, it's been a very analog community. Everything's, you know, done over the phone and bits of paper and maybe some WhatsApp groups if you're lucky. But, but mostly it's a very analog community. So there's a big opportunity to transform that into a digital community that really connects together um, uh, through, you know, through technology. But Georgina's just got her MVP built. So persuading investors and, and grant funding and everything else ahead of this point, that it was, you know, that there was market appetite, could be seen as a pretty tall order. But Georgina's used trials and user groups to, um, to help demonstrate uh, the appetite that there is in the market. She's got a number of shoots signed up to be early users. So showing that there is real appetite, that people really understand what it is um, and that they want to use it as soon as it's available. Uh, is proving, you know, really helpful in her conversations with investors. Um, so, you know, you've got to sometimes be quite creative. Uh, if you want to look at someone who is really good at um, demonstrating market appetite, it's Elon Musk. So he will stand on a stage with a prototype car behind him that they probably pushed onto the, the stage because it's just a shell and there's no engine in it at all and it's just you know, a bit of metal work over a frame, and then he will stand there and sell that. He'll pre-sell it to the audience and say, if you want this when it comes out, um, you need to put down $1,000 each as your deposit. And uh, as soon as it's available, no date given, um, we will, you'll be the first customers on the list to, to purchase it for a price of, you know, $80,000. And within minutes, he has um, millions of dollars in deposits from people who want to be part of this going forward. So he's being able to demonstrate market appetite and also raise some early funding um, just through showing, uh, you know, an early stage prototype. So how you demonstrate that to investors will depend, you know, from pre-seed up to Series A, um, uh, the amount of traction that you've got. Now, your go-to-market strategy, uh, again, um, 
especially in the digital age, and particularly if you are in a B2C type business, um, uh, there is a risk that founders will say, um, well, our go-to-market strategy is social media. And collectively, you'll hear investors kind of drop their head in their hands and go, oh, no, um, because uh, social media is massive and it's very expensive, can be if you're doing advertising, um, uh, and a reliance on things going viral uh, it you know is not something you can count on. So uh, you really need to be able to demonstrate that you understand your market very well. You understand how to connect with them in particular. So are there you know places that your people really hang out, not just random advertising directed as best you can, um, but places that your people really hang out that you can target them. Obviously, if you're in a B2B market, then um, you've potentially got, uh, you know, less difficulty in finding the right people to um, to target as customers because you can do research on companies. But again, you've still got to be very clear on, well, how are you going to go to market? How are you going to get in front of those people? Um, uh, and again, at pre-seed level, that's going to all be experimental, but you need to have good formed ideas of how you will do it up to series A, where you should be saying, we tested, you know, these four or five different approaches to go to market. And this is the one that we found works the best for us, or this combination works the best for us. And that's what we're going to do going forward to, to really scale up um, the business. So then this last thing that investors care about around market is defending your product or service in the market. So that means, you know, how do you defend your market position once you've got it? Do you have um, intellectual property IP that you could protect? Have you protected it? Even if you're at a very early stage, um, if you're at pre-seed and you're about to go out raising investment, and you haven't checked if someone else has already trademarked the company name that you want to use, you could be off to an immediate halt in proceedings um, because you could end up on the end of a, a cease and desist letter. So being very clear on things like trademarking, things like making sure that you know copyright is properly established, that if there is an opportunity to patent something, um, then that helps you, A, to protect your product in the market, but it also helps to create balance sheet value, which means that when you come to value the company, because you've got recorded IP, uh, then that can really help to increase the valuation for the company. And things like that, um, you know, investors will look for, particularly in some uh, sectors. So if uh, if you're looking at um, the medical sector, then, you know, patents are particularly um, sought after and they create huge amounts of balance sheet value. You wouldn't see it so much perhaps in a service company, but but you would still expect to at least see trademarks and, and that kind of thing. Um, we've got a question from Benedetta um, who says, can you do an example of what you would think is a good marketing strategy to pitch to investors? Um, that's kind of a that's kind of a piece of string question because it depends on the type of company that you've got, Benedetta. But um, uh, a good marketing strategy is one that is appropriate for the size and scale of the company that you've got at the moment. So you're not going out to spend millions when actually you just need to get the first 10 customers through the door. Um, it's a, a marketing strategy that is using the right channels to reach people because you know where your potential customers hang out and you know that these channels are the most effective ways of reaching them. So, for instance, if you've got um, uh, a travel app, uh, then the most effective way of reaching people that use it might be advertising on trains or in the tube or wherever, because the people who travel will be going through those places. So you might not need to resort to social media so much because actually you've got a captive audience who flow through particular locations. So if you can show that you've got 
a size and maturity appropriate with, um, strategy with the right channels, spending an appropriate amount of money that you can show will generate um, a return that is more than the marketing spend. So you're not kind of spending yourself into a pit. You're effectively, you know, spending a pound to get three back, that kind of strategy. Then that starts to build together into quite a credible approach for investors. If your strategy is we're going to spend two million pounds in the next year on um, advertising and we'll figure out how we do that later, that's not really great. Um, OK, <laughs> so we're going to move on from market to talk about uh, numbers in just a second. Um, we've got a question from uh, Q Builder who say, is being your own customer a good idea? Building a B2B service and being your own customer and using that to raise revenue as well and prove that as a good fit. Uh, I think I understand what you mean. Um, certainly, if you have created a product or service that you can use yourself as a business, so for instance, if you were the creator of Zero, the accounting package, you would, of course, use it for your own business to show that it worked. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, paying yourself as revenue uh, is a slightly iffy thing. I'm not sure that they'd take that as signs of, you know, <laughs> first first revenue. But certainly, if you can use your own product and you can, you know, show that, you know, you built it for a reason and you're using it for that reason um, uh, and it's working well, then that's definitely uh, something that can really help in the early stages of showing at least um, appropriateness for you know showing that it, it does meet a need that doesn't necessarily prove that anyone else has that need though so you still need to get other people um to also show that they have that need the appetite and that the market wants it and not just you because it could be that you've built something super cool that works really well for you but no one else in the world wants the thing um so so that can you know that can be a challenge um, uh, and then we've got another question from Malak, uh, who says, what are your thoughts, Re, a solo founder applying to a startup accelerator as opposed to applying as a strong founding team? So this is where doing your research really applies because some accelerators are perfectly happy to accept single founders. Some want teams of multiple founders, you know, established management teams. Um, uh, and also it depends again on the stage that your company is at. So if you're at pre-seed level, um, being a solo founder with no one else around you, you know, you're very early on. You're not expected to have a massive team at that stage. If you're trying to approach, you know, uh, seed and, and series A and you're still a solo founder with no team around you, that starts to look like a real risk because that's a single point of failure in the business. If something happens to you, the whole thing tips over. Um, so again, you've got to look at the maturity of the business and then you've got to look at the requirements of the different startup accelerators. But certainly there are ones that are quite happy to accept single founders. And there are some that say we only take teams and, you know, you need to do your research and figure out which ones are going to be the right fit for you. OK, so numbers. Uh, so we're on step four of our six uh, six steps that we were going to, to look at. And why do investors care about numbers? Obviously, because they're in it for the money. Um, investors don't get richer without you um, providing uh, numbers that uh, that look like they can they can make a good return. Uh, But when we're talking about numbers, we're not just talking about financial numbers. We're also talking about metrics. Uh, so investors want to know that you do have a financial model, um, that it's a well thought out financial model. Uh, they also, you know, financial models are about future projections. So they also want to know that you've got um, good 
historical information, that you've got good current management accounts, and that also, ideally, you've got a really strong management dashboard that has, you know, your business metrics in it as it's running live um, so that you can see and keep an eye on, is the business on track? Is it progressing as you wanted it to? Uh, and having all of those things in place tells the investor that you are good at managing your business and keeping on top of it. Um, that, you know, businesses that really track closely uh, what they've done and where they're going are, are much more likely to survive long term and to be profitable long term as well. Uh, it also helps them, um, again, kind of check your credibility. If they look through your financial model or your projections and and see things that they agree with and think, yes, my knowledge of that sector would reflect that that those expectations, those costs that they've articulated are right or close enough, um, then then that helps establish credibility uh, again at pre-seed level. Um, then you know, you're not going to have maybe historical accounts because you've just started. So you can't supply those. Um, and uh, and some people kind of say, oh, there's no point having management accounts because you're not trading yet. But you probably are spending cash as expenses. So starting to have management accounts that show exactly what your outgoings are, what your burn rate is as a pre-seed is still very good practice and shows that you're putting the right elements into managing the business right from the beginning. Um, once you get up to, you know, up to Series A, then you need the whole shebang. You need the historical stuff, you need the future projections, you need the current management accounts, and you need the metrics for how the business is running. And that could be everything from, uh, you know, current number of customers, uh, churn rate, um, uh problems reported by customers um cost of customer acquisition all of those are, are metrics that that the that investors look for and particularly um they look for things uh, uh called unit economics which basically means per unit person um entity that you sell to what does it cost to sell to them uh, and how much are you going to get back from them over the lifetime value of that customer? So all of those metrics are very important. And being able to tell investors that you've thought that stuff through is vital. Now, there's one really important caveat, particularly around numbers, because people get very nervous when they're trying to put together an Excel spreadsheet and it goes out five years and they're saying, but I don't really know what's going to happen in five years. How can I know if this number's going to be right? And the simple answer is no one knows if this number's going to be right. This isn't an exercise in creating perfection. This isn't an exercise in an investor coming back to you, you know, three years later and going, you said that you would be at 10 million and in fact you're at 9 million eight hundred and eighty-eight thousand. That's not really going to happen. Everyone expects that things will change, but it's about the direction being correct, that you're in the ballpark of where it is, and that it's showing that your plans are creditable, that they are, um, you know, they're founded on good assumptions, that they're, that they're not fantasy land. So, so it's really all about credibility, not necessarily total accuracy. So don't get hung up on, are my figures completely right? What the investors want to know is, is it a credible plan um, to go forward? Uh, and, and particularly as you move through the stages, so you get to seed and series A, what they'll start asking you is, um, what was your budget? And did you stick to your budget? And because, you know, if you overran your budget or you underran your budget, what are your, you know, what changes would you make to your forward projections as a result because you've learned something from that underrun or that overrun. So the questions start to get harder the later the stages are that, that happen. OK. Then let's move on to talking about um, investors. So why should you care about investors? Um, 
Uh, and before we do that, we've got a question from Andrea. Um, where would you recommend to find potential tech co-founders? Um, so there are quite a few organizations out there that can help you find co-founders. Um, Silicon Roundabout do some stuff around that. Um, if you also go to um, uh, the Founders and Mentors community run by um, 12 Ronnies, that also has um, an ability on there to connect with other um, uh, tech co-founders as well. So there's lots of community things out there. And, and you know, if it comes down to it, if you've got a business idea and you want a tech co-founder, use things like LinkedIn as well. Do Again, do your research and see if you can connect with the right people via LinkedIn that will, that will help you find somebody. Um, universities can also be a really good breeding ground for good tech co-founders. If you want someone who's, you know, fresh, fresh onto the market with lots of enthusiasm, they may not be as experienced as some other tech co-founders, um, but they might be a lot cheaper as well. So there's pros and cons, um, but, but there's lots of different ways to find tech co-founders. OK, so let's talk about why you should care about investors. Uh, so. When you're looking at who you want to try and approach to get investment, you know, you're obviously thinking about what do they really want? What you know, what would make me resonate with them? Uh, and, you know, the first thing is that you need to make sure that they actually invest in your type of company. One of the biggest issues that we have in the startup ecosystem at the moment is the, uh, the level of inappropriate decks that are sent to investors that never match up to their investment criteria. So that means that investors are wading through hundreds or thousands of decks per year for you know products and services that are things that they would never invest in and if you did research on them you would realize that so sending decks to people that aren't going to invest in you is a waste of your time and a waste of their time as well and if actually all startup founders really weighed in on the research up front and then only contacted investors who really do invest in their space we'd have a lot less traffic and it would be a lot easier for investors to see which ones are actually worth putting some money into so when i'm talking about do they invest in your space um you need to be sure that they invest in your sector that they invest in your business model so if you're b2c or b2b or b2b2c uh you know do they invest in that type of business model because investors will differentiate against that do they invest in your stage uh, so, you know, plenty of VCs don't invest below seed or even below series A for some of them, um, but some will invest at pre-seed level. Do they invest in single founders or only, you know, two plus founders? Again, some will, some won't. Do they invest um, if you haven't got revenue yet or if you've got, you know, members or users demonstrating traction but no revenue, will they invest? So, you know, you need to understand that. Um, and uh, and also some investors will only invest if you've got skin in the game, i.e. actual cash that you've invested into the business. Sweat equity doesn't matter to some investors. They don't care how much time you've put into the thing, um, but they want to know that you've put cash in as well. Otherwise, they're not willing to put their cash in either. So you need to know all of those things before you go and try to pitch to someone to see if um, they're the right investor for you. Now you can find out a lot of that information on databases like um, Crunchpace and PitchBook and, um, uh, and Bowhill. Uh, then, um, uh, and there are also, you know, angel clubs, angel networks, where you can go and have initial discussions with them about what type, you know, what real criteria they set for people investing. If you're looking at VCs, um, you know, their websites have quite a bit of information on. Some of it's not quite as clear as it could be, uh, which is a personal bugbear, but um, they do have information on their websites. And then you can follow that up by looking at their portfolio. So they always announce who their portfolio is that they've invested in. And you can look at the portfolio and say, do I fit 
into that portfolio group that they've invested in. Not am I exactly the same as, because you obviously, you know, don't want to um, be invested in by someone who's already invested in a competitor. Uh, but for instance, if you are in the medical devices market, then um, have they invested in other types of medical devices that don't tackle the same problem as you? Yes, good, that's a safe bet that they probably might be interested dependent on the stage of your company, revenue, all of those types of things. Um, so, so that's looking at things from the investor's perspective. Uh, but you also need to think about what you want from an investor as well. So we've talked about what investors really want all through this session, but it's really vital that you know what you want before you start approaching investors as well. So, you know, do you want investors that have um, invested multiple times before and they're very experienced? Do you want investors that are hands on are going to offer their expertise? Or do you want someone to just give you some cash and leave you alone? Um, uh, so you really need to think about what kind of investors you want to. Uh, and again, you know, talking to other other portfolio have invested. Um, so so really thinking about that and building up an avatar, if you like, of what your ideal investor would look like um, is, is super important. Because again, that allows you to filter, it allows you to save time. Uh, you know, you don't want to, if you want hands off money, uh, you don't want added expertise, there's no point in going to an investor who will automatically expect a board seat um, and a real say in how the business is run. That just is a waste of, of everybody's time. Okay, so uh, so we've talked about investors. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. So one from uh, Charlotte Vermadal, who says, what do investors want to see in a pre-seed financial model? Does it need to be detailed? Um, so financial models, much like strategies, can be uh, allowed to fade over time. So they want to know in real detail what you think your spending plans would be and your revenue might be over the next you know, 18 months, two years, because that's the period that you're going to be raising money for. So if you don't know what you're going to spend the money on, that's a real problem. After that, you can start to go in at a much higher level and say, you know, you might end up in a formula from that point that says, OK, it's, it's year two plus 10 percent. As long as that's based on a, an assumption, something that you know about the market that shows that that, that growth or that increase in expenses is expected, that's OK. Um, but, but definitely you need much more detail in the kind of two years closer to you. And then you can kind of gradually fade out to higher levels of detail for, for the following years. So I hope that's, um, that's helpful on that one. Um, and then... Uh, we've got a question from, I really hope I pronounced this right, Anya, uh, who says, where to find investors? Are there any strategies? Yes, there are strategies. Um, and the simple answer is that you always start closest to home. So you think of it like a concentric circle. So you start in the middle and you look at the people closest to you. Uh, and um, your friends, your family, um, your, you know, your personal connections, and you start talking to them first. So quite often you might find that, you know, you start off sitting there thinking, I don't know anyone who's an investor, um, but just because they don't have investor in their LinkedIn profile or you didn't know before that they invested doesn't mean that they don't or wouldn't want to invest in you if they know you well. So you always start off with the people who are closest to you uh, and you go and talk to them and tell them what you're doing and say that you're looking for investors. Do they know of anyone who might be an appropriate investor to have a conversation with? And that's a cue for them to, to say, yes, actually me, I'd be interested or oh, uh, not me, but I know someone who and they can introduce you further. Um, once once you've kind of exhausted that ring of people and quite often that's enough to get you through your first raise um then you go on to you know a wider piece of research around perhaps angel investors um who would be appropriate and then you can start using databases and angel networks and clubs and all of those kinds of things um and then you know the next layer on might be might be more institutional investment where you're going to to vcs 
Um, or, you know, you might decide that you're going to do crowdfunding and so you, you're going to raise a, um, your, your private side funding uh, from a couple of angel investors and then um, put the rest out to the crowd and actually you're going to, you know, build um, uh, relationships with your users and turn them into your investors instead. So, again, depending upon where you're at in your journey, finding investors can be a very different experience each time. Uh, and then David Moran says, how would you go about valuing a pre-seed business? Good question. Um, <laughs> it's another one of those piece of string questions. Uh, the, the simple things are, um, uh, you know, there are a number of different um, mechanisms out there for valuing businesses. Not all of them are appropriate for very early stage companies. Um, so you need to you need to look at the methods that are appropriate. So the, the VC method, the discount cash flows, that type of thing um, it is much more helpful than um, uh, a kind of assets plus book approach, which you might get in a much more stable later stage business. Um, uh, the important things to think about with with, you know, a pre-seed business is size of market opportunity is always going to be key. What have you already achieved that shows that there is value in the business, that it's something worth buying? So do you have IP already? Do you have, you know, wireframes, MVPs developed? Um, uh, do you have, uh, so we're working with a, a company at the moment who um, ha have developed a complex mathematical model that supports everything that their business will do going forward. And that's a huge piece of IP that not many people could actually create. So um, so that would actually support their valuation um, at this stage of the game. Uh, so, yeah, so valuing it is really adding up elements you can benchmark against others that have gone before you, um, uh, who, you know, what valuation did they get at pre-seed level? Um, uh, and, and it's like putting together a jigsaw. So you have to find all the parts, put them all together and then work out, you know, what the answer, what the answer tells you from there. So it's not a straightforward answer, I'm afraid. Um, I wish I could be more helpful, uh, but it is important that you recognize all the separate elements. Okay. Uh, so moving on from investors, our last step is pitch. So how you pitch verbally and in your pitch materials, uh, investors care about massively because it tells them uh, whether you have confidence in what you're doing, whether you actually understand what you're doing and can describe it to other people. Um, whether you can communicate well, because if you can't communicate well to investors, can you communicate well when you're doing sales? Maybe not. Um, uh, and that could be a really big issue. Um, it, it, they also look for consistency. So uh, we we have something um, uh, in the business that we call the golden funnel. Uh, and there has to be consistency from, from top to bottom. So you start the top of your, um, uh, well, less a funnel, more of a pyramid, really. Um, you start at the top with your pitch deck, which is, you know, 15 slides, shiny promises, not much detail. Um, and then underneath that, you've got your business plan, um, which is quite a lot more detail on how you would do what you've promised in the pitch deck. But it has to be completely consistent with what you've said in the pitch deck. And then below that, you've got your financial model, which explains, you know, what it would cost to do what you said you'd do in the business plan. And again, that's got to be completely consistent. And then below that, you've got your data room, which is the evidence that supports everything you've claimed in the business plan, the pitch deck and the financial model. Uh, so you're really looking, you know, in there to show the proof of here's the research, here's the financial data, the bank statements, the whatever that support what you're saying in all the elements above. So consistency through all of those elements is vital. And one thing that really trips people up um, when they're trying to be fast and agile and getting out there and talking to investors is they update their pitch deck, but they forget to update their business plan and their financial model. Uh, and then suddenly you end up with 
you know, different versions, you end up with something that's being said in the pitch deck that isn't reflected in the financial model. And that starts to cause real wariness in investors if they, you know, they ask for the further information and the consistency doesn't flow through. So, so your pitch must be consistent all the way through. Um, you know, again, um, at pre-seed, your pitch is going to be quite different to uh, your pitch at Series A. So at pre-seed, you're talking about possibilities and opportunities and what might be, you know, what might be in the future. Whereas at Series A, um, your pitch deck is as much about reflecting what you've done and then what you're going to do next. So there's a real um, difference, uh, if you like, in pitch decks from a from a pre-seed to a, to a Series A because you have to reflect achievements so far, successes, things you've learned, why you've pivoted, all of that kind of stuff is vital in a Series A. Even in a seed, um, you'll have, you know, you'll have moved on several stages from pre-seed and you'll be expected to be able to explain, you know, what you've done so far and then where you're going next. Whereas pre-seed is kind of a, a fresh sheet. You will have achieved some things, maybe you've built your MVP, but you won't have got far off the starting blocks. So it's a very different, um, a very different feel to the to the deck when you're doing that. Um, business plans will vary in complexity and length depending upon the maturity of the business as well. So pre-seed um, will have you know a business plan that's shorter and more succinct, but still has a good level, of, excuse me, of detail in it. A Series A business plan could be much more in depth, really, you know, really showing exactly um, what has happened, what's going to happen next, um, all of those types of things. At pre-seed level, um, you might talk more about what you're going to test and learn from. At seed and Series A, you'll talk about what you have tested and learned from. So, again, there's all these differences that, that would feed in. Whatever the level that you're at, um, you need to make sure that through your pitch deck and your business plan that you've really covered what the problem is, what the market opportunity is, what the mission is that you're on, what are you trying to ultimately achieve, what the solution is that you're creating and why is it different and better than anything else out there, um, what the revenue model is that you're putting in place, what achievements you've you've managed so far, what your future roadmap is, and then um, who competitors might be, and, and again, you know, why you're different and better, what your financials are, how much you're raising and what you're going to spend it on. The balance of what you spend it on is really important to investors. And finally, who your team are. So making sure that you've got all of those elements included. OK, so we are just about coming to the top of the session um, with two minutes to spare. If you've got any more questions that you would like to add, please do pop them into the chat quickly so that we can tackle those before we end um, the session. I hope uh, that that's been a useful walk through what investors are really looking for and why. Um, that will help you to really formulate your approaches to raising investment going forward. Um, we've got a question from um, Rick, who says, are investors interested in IP licensing business models or do they generally prefer investing in self-standing startup companies? Uh, again, do your research, Rick. Uh, there will be investors out there who are interested and investors who very definitely aren't. And uh, you need to find the ones that are and approach them. But the, pretty much there's an investor on this planet for everything that anyone comes up with. But you've got to find the right ones and you've got to, to do the research first. So, um, yeah, don't don't assume that people aren't interested in, in investing in IP licensing um, because uh, that's perfectly possible. Uh, uh, Alex says, oh, what was in between market opportunity and solution just then in the list of things that need to be included? Um, it was mission, Alex. So um, what mission are you on? What are you actually trying to achieve? So, you know, are you trying to achieve, um, you know, reducing plastic in the ocean by 20 percent? 
Are you trying to um, support small businesses in, um, uh, you know, in increasing their um, marketing abilities, etc.? Whatever it is that what mission are you on? Super. Okay. Um, I hope you found the session useful. If you would like to connect with me outside of this session, please feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. I'm on there, Julie A. Barber. Um, and you can also find my book, uh, Investor Ready, on Amazon as well, if you'd like to go and have a look at that, or come and visit our website, which is www.spark-consulting.co.uk. Have a great rest of your day, um, and I look forward to hopefully speaking to a few of you via social media.